Welcome. We will be speaking uh, about how to build and maintain a distribution in Drupal 7. I'm Andrea Pescetti, and Antonio De Marco will speak uh, later. Both of us are from Nuvole, a 100% uh, Drupal company based uh, in Belgium, in Brussels, and uh, in Italy, in Parma. Nuvole, by the way, means clouds in Italian, if you are just curious about our name. Our clients uh, are in Europe and uh, in the US, and uh, we work with a distributed team. We don't uh, maintain a, a distribution ourselves, but uh, we work a lot with existing Drupal distributions, and actually, as you will uh, see later, we build every project uh, as if it were a distribution. Our work is mostly with international organizations, especially in Brussels. This one, for example, is a screenshot of uh, a customized uh, Open Atrium installation that uh, we built for a European project. As you can see, we built mapping integration there, and uh, they are using it uh, for uh, a network of uh, experts of uh, international education and uh, for uh, storing uh, rich uh, user profiles uh, and uh, interacting uh, in private groups. This is another project uh, we just started for another international organization. This time it is a cooperation between uh, Europe and Latin America, uh, again in the education sector, and uh, they are sharing techniques uh, through a customized uh, Open Atrium platform. So to come to the presentation, we are first introducing what a Drupal distribution is. It is not immediately clear. I mean, for us, a Drupal distribution is uh, what you see here, a prepackaged Drupal installation that is meant to address a specific use case. This does not uh, include uh, all cases of distributions, and we are getting to it in a couple of minutes. Popular distributions in this sense are uh, Open Atrium, uh, that is currently maintained by phase two. It is uh, well known. It is a platform for uh, collaboration, a collaboration tool for, uh, for groups. And uh, it is uh, also very suitable for uh, ca customization and advanced customization. And this is what uh, we mostly do. It is still on Drupal 6, as most distributions in, in these examples. Managing news is an aggregator of uh, news and feeds from different sources and with uh, all different standards, again maintained by phase two currently. Then COD is a very popular distribution, is a conference uh, organizing distribution everything you need to organize a conference based on Drupal. Videola is uh, a platform for a video solution and um, streaming. Open Publish uh, is uh, again another well-known distribution meant uh, to, to manage a news site with uh, everything already ready for a publication of news. And open public is uh, currently the, the only one in this set of examples that uh, has a stable uh, release for Drupal 7. And uh, it is meant for a governmental organization. So again, you see that uh, all of these are Drupal, but in each case, uh, Drupal has been heavily customized and pre-configured to turn it uh, into a product. Uh, not uh, something to, to work on, but a prepackaged product uh, with uh, a set of standard uh, characteristics that are, uh, for example, that a product uh, must be pre-configured, completely pre-configured. I mean, uh, it must come as an out-of-the-box solution for us. So uh, this is uh, our uh, idea of distribution. 
something that is heavily pre-configured at the point that uh, you just need to install it and it will be pre-configured out of the box. It is repeatable. You can install it as many times uh, as you wish. It's uh, really completely packaged uh, and repeatable exactly on multiple instances. And then, of course, if you have a product, uh, then there is a product life cycle. So you have to maintain the, this uh, product uh, because people will be installing it and uh, needing uh, future upgrades or uh, new features. And you will need to design an upgrade path. People will be installing OpenAtrium uh, 1.0 and at a certain point, uh, you will need to provide them with OpenAtrium uh, 1.1 or uh, something that they can upgrade to. And uh, this is a burden for the developer uh, in, uh, in the idea of, of packaging a, a full product. Now, some of these uh, features apply to installation profiles too. But uh, in the sense we will uh, <coughs> use in this presentation, we are distinguishing installation profiles and distributions. For us, an installation profile is something that uh, is repeatable, of course. In, uh, you ship uh, Drupal with uh, a set of modules with uh, a minimal pre-configuration. But uh, how much configuration you put there is uh, really the difference for us. Because one could well say that from a syntactical point of view, this is the standard Drupal installation. This is a distribution just a distribution with uh, nothing more than Drupal core. But syntactically, here you have everything that is uh, needed to, to call it a distribution. Of course, what uh, forbids to call it a distribution in our interpretation is that uh, you are left alone. Just uh, when you have installed Drupal, you don't have something that is working out of the box. It's something you are supposed to work on. So syntactically, there is no difference between uh, an installation profile, uh, even the default installation profile, and the distribution. But uh, here is the key difference. When uh, you are shipping a distribution profile, your focus is developers, people who will be able to work on, on this profile. Th uh, you just provide them tools, and then uh, it's up to them to build uh, stuff with it. And uh, it's a platform they can build upon while well, a distribution is ready to use. Someone with, uh, say, very little uh, Drupal knowledge or uh, just with site building, uh, standard site building knowledge, will find something that uh, is working out of the box and uh, he can start immediately and then maybe customize it, but focus is on final use. All of this, of course, is perfectly standard Drupal. I mean, it is uh, a Drupal core a set of modules, themes, uh, in general, what we call code, and uh, configuration. And again, what we are focusing uh, on to call it a distribution is this last part, configuration. Configuration is hard uh, to store. It's uh, not natural to store in, um, in Drupal because the point of view of Drupal is that traditionally, Configuration is stored in database. But uh, here is the main obstacle where, uh, when you are trying to ship something that uh, contains configuration, you cannot ship configuration as a database dump. Not uh, conveniently. If you need a huge list of drawbacks, you can find them here. We, we can review them quickly, but uh, it should be rather obvious. I mean, first, you have severe limits on repeatability. Our product is meant to be repeatable. We want to be able to install it anywhere where our Drupal supports it. And uh, if we are shipping with the dump, we are hard coding a choice of database engine, possibly. We are hard coding table prefixes, and our user that wants a different table prefix uh, must work around it, or we can find weird ways to, to adapt our database. And if you, we ship with the database dump, we don't start clean. We start from a dirty state, from something that uh, is something we have been working on and that at a certain point we dumped for everybody to get uh, an exact copy of uh, what we have. And then, of course, especially 
since we are talking about products here, it will be extremely difficult to upgrade. If the newer version of our distributions carries a, a database dump, we are going to destroy everything the user created in between to completely break uh, the upgrade path for our users. Because uh, in database, now they will have a mix of configuration and content. Also for developers, it is very hard to maintain because uh, especially for uh, us, we work in a distributed team, uh, so we need a workflow that uh, does not assume that um, people are just uh, close to each other, that they can work freely, and uh, they cannot uh, lock a database uh, and uh, tell each other, please do not touch anything uh, while I'm working on, on this feature. Uh, <coughs> of course, a database is a problem in this case, and it is very easy to, to lose control, ultimately. So, the idea is that the distribution must, and we will see how, store all configuration in code. We have to. There is uh, no way we can ship uh, with the database dump and uh, still call it a product uh, in a proper way. Storing configuration in code has benefits that of course uh, correspond to, to the drawbacks we've seen before for database dumps. And uh, moreover, we have uh, everything that is generated by PHP code that is database agnostic, so we are not making any assumptions uh, on, uh, on what users are doing. We have a clean installation procedure, and uh, we can uh, define a clear upgrade path. So we will be able to guide our users uh, to an upgrade of our distribution without uh, interfering with uh, their existing content. And also for developers, this is much easier to, to maintain because when everything is in PHP code, it's much easier to inspect for developers so I can see very quickly what uh, a colleague is working on or what he changed, when he changed it. And uh, if uh, there is a conflict, uh, we can solve it uh, by simple comparison, standard uh, source file uh, way. And content and settings, uh, this way, are completely separated. So after this introduction to distribution set products, uh, as products, we, we can go on and look at how to build a distribution. Okay, <coughs> so let's start to build a distribution. Uh, distribution, as uh, Andrea said, is a product, so you must think about a name for it, give it maybe a logo, uh, and then start to package content together. So let's meet our distribution, Drupalissimo. So there is, a, it's just not actual distribution, it's just a distribution we are going to use it uh, for our examples during our presentation. So how I would bootstrap the project then? I need two things. I need to get my code from different locations, uh, put it together to make then the code base for our distribution. And then I need an installation profile to manage my installation process. So the first one, we're going to do using a make file. Make file, um, so the distributions uh, buildings blocks are the core, of course. Then you have uh, different modules. You can have uh, contributed modules, uh, custom modules that you would write for your distribution or even patched modules. So when you apply some patches to, to fix some problems. Then teams, several teams, somebody depending on some, uh, somebody else. And then external libraries. All these uh, building blocks comes from uh, different uh, locations. They may come from Drupal.org, from GitHub, for example, or uh, from uh, other sources, like uh, the external library, like uh, Open Layers or jQuery. So um, we need a convenient way to then uh, fetch all these codes automatically coming from different locations. And this is where uh, Drush Make com comes into play. So the best way to package code is to use uh, Drush Make. What is Dash Make? Uh, it's um, a Drush extensions that uh, allows you to describe the code you are going to use for your project using just a simple .info syntax, so a syntax we are all familiar with as Drupal developers, and uh, um, allows you to do it uh, just with one uh, line, uh, command line of um, 
of Drush. So single uh, info file to describe the modules, the dependencies, and then uh, also the patches that you would apply to the modules you download. Uh, it can download it uh, all, the, you can, it can build for you all the distribution just with one line command. And then it's also a really nice uh, way to keep uh, uh, an index of your projects. So to see which modules are you using, et cetera. Especially useful when you work with, this, uh, with a distributed team, for example. So let's have a close up. Um, for a distribution, you will usually need two make file. The distro make file, which will pack the, co the, the core and the profile, and then the Drupalissimo make file, which is the make file of the, our distribution specifically. So the distro make, patch, package then the core and the profile. So let's see how it looks like. As you see, it's uh, a typical uh, uh, info file syntax. You have some directives, for example, specify the core of all, uh, that you're working on, the Drupal core. Then you say, okay, download for me uh, Drupal projects, the, the core of it, is, uh, and then the version is 7.7. .7. As you can see, then you can also apply patches to the Drupal core. This is actually a real life example uh, taken from BuildKit, and these patches are uh, to make the, some elements, some uh, components in the Drupal core exportable, like for example, vocabulary names or uh, uh, input filters, etc. So then you can uh, download uh, the Drupal core and apply some patches to it uh, directly. And this is the command line that, uh, the command that does it. So you have like uh, dash make, uh, distro dot make, and then the directory where the distribution will be uh, stored. As you can see, the result of this command is uh, uh, the, the Drupal uh, project is downloaded and then patches are applied, and you also get uh, a report in patches.txt to keep track of the patch that you applied to, to your distribution. So where is my installation profile now? Because uh, so far, we just uh, packaged the, the Drupal core. So there it is. You have to also specify, of course, uh, the location of your uh, pr installation profile. The installation profile is uh, another element that the make file would download. So it needs uh, um, a specific uh, uh, declaration in the, into the, the make file. So there it is. Uh, in the first uh, bracket, you have like the, the name of the pro installation profile, which is Drupalissimo in our case. The type is a profile, so Drupal will know that it will store the code downloaded by, by this directive inside the profile directory. Then you have also the different type of download. You can download the profile from Drupal.org, or for example, in this case, you can download it from a Git repository stored on GitHub. So let's see what, what we get when we get this uh, installation profile. So installation profile will have uh, a distro make, so its own file, and then also another make file, Drupalissimo.make, which is the installation prof the make file of the distribution. Um, one uh, interesting feature of Drush Make is that uh, it uh, acts um, recursively. So when it downloads a package, uh, when it finds another make file, it will also execute that one. So in this way, you just need to call uh, Drush Make uh, distro make and name of the directory, and then it will also download all the um, components specified into the Drupalissimo.make file, which is then your uh, distribution file. So let's have uh, a way, uh, let's have a close up uh, of the dis distribution of the um, make file. So it looks like, again, an info file. So you have like the modules of your uh, distribution um, with the version you would uh, like to download. Uh, you can specify themes, libraries, patches to modules, and then also, of course, the features uh, of your uh, distribution, so the main components that you may download from uh, Git repositories, for example. In this case, in this example, we have only two, two features, so the Drupalissimo core, uh, which is the core feature of our project, which stores all the, the project-wide configuration, let's say, and then the Drupalissimo blog, which is a, a blog feature that we would like to uh, enable in our project. So, um, there is a project in Drupal.org called BuildKit. BuildKit is a startup uh, um, distribution, which uh, basically package all the, um, the th modules and the themes and configuration that you may need when you start a new project. But it also gives you the possibility to reuse its make file in your distribution as a starting point. Um, this is possible because, uh, yeah, that's a build, uh, build kit uh, page. This is possible because uh, the Drush make actually uh, allows you to include other make file inside your distribution. This can keep your uh, make files really clean. For example, uh, your distro make now would look like this. Uh, you just include the build kit uh, distro make, which has the, the, the core download and the patches to the core that we saw before. And then basically you just add your uh, profile 
your Drupal ISIM profile, where to get it, uh, and that's the, your distro-make file. Same thing goes for the Drupal .make, so for your uh, distribution-make file. You can uh, include the, the, distribu the um, distribution uh, make of build kits, and then you can just uh, extend it with the features or even other modules, other patches, etc. So this uh, helps also to keep, uh, to also start up a, a, a distribution really easily without uh, copy pasting from other make files and uh, possibly making mistakes, etc. So the second part now, the installation profile, because so far we just patched the content. We, ju we just uh, get, uh, got the code base for our project. We need to install now the, our Drupal uh, distribution. So we need an installation profile. Installation profiles are uh, made of uh, three files. One info file, which uh, lists the dependency of uh, your distribution, which means uh, uh, that uh, the, the, the profile will enable all these dependencies for you. Then an install uh, file that, that behaves exactly like the install of uh, your modules. So it uh, performs installation tasks, tasks and also upgrades. This is also a very important point for uh, Drupal 7 distributions. And then there is also a dot .profile file that is uh, a fully customizable, uh, makes the, your, your, your um, uh, installation profile uh, form fully customizable, exposing some APIs. So uh, let's have a look to drupalissimo.info. It's a normal info file, the, really the same as uh, any modules. So you can uh, specify your core dependencies, your contrib dependencies, and then your, your, your features as well. This means that uh, after you have run the drush make, so the loading all this code, then you are now uh, um, ready to install this code using your installation profile. Uh, thanks to the info file, uh, the Drupal will enable all these dependencies, so you will have all your uh, modules enabled. Now, let's have a look how to customize your, the installation uh, profile procedure for the, for the final user to really go smoothly through it. You may want to add some new steps or to prefill some forms or to uh, add some uh, interaction forms with the users for your uh, specific use case. So for doing these installation profiles, expose you um, APIs. Like for example, normal form alter. So you can really like behave like you are in a module even though you are in a profile. So you can uh, alter, for example, the install configuration uh, form. Uh, in this example, we just uh, prefilled some, uh, some, some form input fields to help the user to go quicker through the installation process. And this is the result. Basically, you have the site name prefilled Drupalissimo. Then you have uh, site email addresses, etc. username admin. So you can a bit speed up the, uh, the process. Then what you can do also is to add installation tasks to the installation profile which are the, the small ticks you saw on the, on the sidebar. Here we have two tasks, uh, create taxonomy terms, which will obviously create taxonomy terms for our distribution, and then also the configuration uh, task that will configure our uh, set features. These tasks uh, end up there on the, um, on the sidebar, so the user will go also through these steps. In these steps, you can also put, uh, you can also add forms for user interaction to ask users some, some uh, information about uh, specific uh, uh, features of your, uh, of your uh, distribution. For example, the, create, uh, the um, term creation task performs uh, simple term creation, so it just fetch a vocabulary and then it creates like uh, the default terms that you may need then into, the, into your distribution. This is also specifically useful when you need to make assumption about a term that is already present in your distribution in order to uh, configure it, for example, as a, to use it, uh, use it as a context reaction or something like that. So this is the way to do it. So uh, when the profi installation profile will come through this uh, step, then it will create uh, the, your starting uh, taxonomy term. And the same, you go for uh, the site features uh, configuration. Here you, you want to add, for example, an, um, a user role, like editor. You make some operation in your features. You revert some components, like variables or user permission. And you enable also the custom team. You want to ship with, already with the team, not with Garland, probably. So you have your Drupalissimo team inside your distribution. So you want also to uh, enable the team. And that's the place to do. So as an installation task, you may enable also, also a new team. So, um, so far, uh, we've seen uh, how to get basically to an installation profile, uh, even uh, if you have uh, seen features popping around and popping out at times, uh, but uh, we haven't introduced uh, 
it completely, and uh, this section is actually about, uh, again, uh, having a full configured product. So how to ship with uh, full configuration using uh, this uh, very nice tool that is a module called Features and uh, is the best way to, to package configuration. So if uh, we want to have uh, content types uh, and views and context uh, with, uh, shipped uh, with our distribution, we will generate features that uh, package this information. A feature itself can be defined as a collection of elements that satisfy a certain use case. And um, actually, features produces modules. That the output of a, of a feature is producing a module that will store configuration for your website. So you can see it uh, as a way to export uh, configuration into PHP code. So this is the missing link uh, uh, from uh, <coughs> earlier talks uh, that uh, links how to have configuration in database and how to have it uh, in a PHP code. Configuration in database is organized in a very inconvenient way for uh, one who would like to, to package it uh, in, uh, in a logical way by features because uh, in database you have all views together Meaning, uh, using the same tables, more or less. Uh, contexts uh, are together, uh, image styles are together, and this is exactly the opposite of what uh, we would like to obtain. What we would like to obtain is uh, our distribution will have uh, a, a feature called uh, news that will contain everything uh, necessary for this, uh, this modular functionality. That is, it will contain the definition of content type, contexts that are related to news, views that are related to news, and um, image styles that are related to news. So we just need to, to put things together in another way. Creating a feature is uh, rather simple. There is a graphical user interface in the model that uh, you can use. For a, for a start, you just define basic fields. On the right, uh, you can see there's a, on the right hand side, there's an edit components uh, select, where you just select what components you would like to put uh, in a feature. So if you are building a feature for news, everything related to news will go there. There's also a nice uh, auto detection mechanism for uh, dependencies that uh, will uh, try to guess what's uh, needed uh, for uh, your feature to, to be enabled and installed. And then you just get uh, the, the button to download your feature. At the end, you will get something like this. So a set of PHP files that store, that, uh, store information about a certain piece of functionality for your site. It has an info file because features are modules. Uh, let's have a look at this uh, info file. Again, you see the dependencies that are modules that need to be enabled when enabling the feature or need to be en <coughs> enabled just, just before enabling it. And then a set of exportable things that uh, are put uh, in code. You can see here permission, variables, and so on. Uh, this is not their values, just what we are putting uh, in code. So the next question is, uh, once we know how to create a feature, how to uh, fetch configuration from database and put it in PHP code, what's the most logical way to package it? The most logical way is not uh, the trivial one that uh, is, I will just uh, try to find uh, everything in, in my website, uh, all content types, views, uh, and context, and put it in one feature. I will just create uh, a big features that uh, a big feature that I will call Drupalissimo all with everything uh, in uh, in it. This is not working. This is not working because the idea behind features is to be as modular as possible. So. Mm, while uh, 
it, uh, it may work, uh, it is not the way to do it. So we want to divide the site functionality into independent pieces, just think about it, and then we will put the several features together to build the site. There is another option that is building uh, transversal features, but um, we do not support uh, it. The idea is that uh, one could imagine having a feature that is called uh, site permissions and dump all site permissions there. So, um, this is not right because it is not modular, of course. It is a transversal feature where you have all site permission across all content types, for instance. And uh, it's better to bundle permissions with the functionality they belong to. So if I have feature news, the permission related to the news content type, who can edit news, who can uh, create new news items, should be packaged with that feature and uh, not in a transversal feature. And uh, if you have miscellaneous permissions, like uh, access content uh, in general, you can uh, have a site-specific features for these very generic permissions that do not belong to any modular piece of functionality. So here is uh, an example of uh, an info file for um, our Drupalissimo blog feature. And as you can see, everything related uh, to blogs is there. So here uh, you find uh, all fields, uh, all images that, uh, uh, image styles that we are going to use in a blog, all permissions that are related to blog posts, uh, and everything uh, that is part of this functionality. You enable it, and uh, it's there. You disable it, and everything disappears. So it's completely modular. It helps a lot when building features to use naming conventions. This will allow you to use features very effectively. You might have noticed it um, before, but uh, we are seeing it uh, in a minute again. There's a kit the specification called kit that will guide you in uh, choosing proper names for all elements you are exporting uh, into features. The idea is to build uh, compatible features and interoperable features. Uh, it, you need a lot of conventions uh, in this world uh, and uh, conventions are, are very good uh, when you are programming this style. Uh, in, uh, you, you will still have a lot of flexibility but uh, if you adhere to certain naming conventions, uh, your life will be much easier. For instance, you have a code namespace. When I build a feature, I will uh, generate a unique identifier for that feature. I'm creating uh, a, a blog feature for Drupalissimo. I will call it Drupalissimo blog, meaning that, uh, that the module file will, be, will have this name. And um, then internally, I can shorten it to just blog because at this point it is uh, just the functionality of my website. So not this particular Drupalissimo blog, but uh, the blog functionality of, of my website. I'm supposed to use one blog functionality in my website. And uh, for example, the, the listing uh, view for, uh, for my blog posts would be called blog listing. Again, use this uh, name as a prefix for everything belonging to it. So it will make uh, things much easier to find. If you are uh, using uh, recent blog posts as a name of a view, you are getting lost very soon. It's much uh, easier to, to prefix everything uh, with uh, the, the code namespace of what we, uh, we are using. Just use it as a namespace. So far we've seen how to create a feature and uh, how to design it uh, in abstract, but uh, we are missing uh, a point that is how to develop a feature. Uh, once we have created it, uh, while developing we will be changing it, uh, and the feature has a, a nice standard mechanism for it. Uh, it supports uh, two operations that are very handy during development, that is update, it will export the current configuration into PHP code, so everything you put in a feature will be 
regenerated uh, uh, when you update uh, that feature, you get uh, newer PHP code corresponding to the current configuration, and the revert operation is more or less the opposite, uh, and it will enforce the configuration that is stored in your PHP code. So whatever you have done after the, the PHP code and the database were synchronized uh, will be in a way overridden uh, by, by this uh, revert, uh, will be reverted actually. We go back to the status that was stored in PHP code. And uh, every component of a feature, like uh, a view, a context, uh, can uh, live in the database, in code, or both. So your uh, blog listing view will be described in code somewhere, will uh, or will not, depending on technical um, differences, live uh, in database, or will be in both, uh, and will be possibly different in both. So features uh, need to keep track of everything, and it uses this concept of component state. Component state is default if the um, object has n is not in database, or if the database entry is matching uh, perfectly the state of component in code. So what uh, your real configuration is what is stored in code. This is perfect, this is the stable situation. Uh, I've not changed anything. If, in, uh, um, if I have something different uh, in database than in code, the state is overridden. To be more precise, this means that the database object was changed and the code is unchanged to the latest, uh, from the latest check that uh, features did. So features know that something has changed and it knows that what has changed is the database. So I have overridden what I have in PHP code. Here it would be natural to uh, update the feature to enforce uh, the current configuration. Say I edited a view and I wanted the, the modified view to go in my feature, then I will update it uh, and the new code will match my current configuration or I will revert it uh, and uh, go back. There is a third state uh, in its review that means uh, that uh, feature detected that uh, I changed both the database and the code. Uh, and this means uh, I have to manually review it because uh, both states are different from um, the, the latest uh, state it has seen and uh, it does not know who must win between changes I made in database and changes I made in, in code. If someone uh, wonders how can features keep track of it, it's uh, with MD5 hashes. I mean, it says the current code for the component the most recent uh, prior code state differing from the current code state. So the, the last thing I saw that is different from what I have now, and this will detect uh, an SVN update or any operation that changed code, and then the normal component state uh, that is just uh, what's in database or what uh, is effective in, uh, in this moment, to be more precise. With these MD5 hashes, features can know what's changed and can propose me to, to work uh, uh, properly, not to lose what I did. Another distinction we need to make is between hard and soft configuration. There is some stuff that will have to go into features and some configuration that we will not put into features. For example, a view or a context is part of the hard configuration, meaning uh, if the site administrator changes it, uh, he will consciously be overriding my feature, his configuration will be different from the product I shipped, uh, and then uh, he knows uh, that uh, he might be at risk uh, in upgrades, because uh, I will assume that uh, we are starting from my unmodified features. On the other hand, there is a soft configuration, stuff that is meant to be overridden, say the default team. I can have a product uh, and uh, ship uh, three teams with it. Then uh, it's up to the site administrator to choose one, 
and the upgrade process should not be broken by this. And the trick is not to store this in features, but to store it in the installation profile so that altering it will not change the feature state. And uh, when the site administrator checks his features, they will not be overridden because we are allowing this to be overridden. It's a so-called soft configuration. This is upgrade safe. Look here, in, uh, you have already seen this slide, part of this slide, and uh, we are doing it as part of the installation profile. Now this explains why we embedded some configuration in the installation profile. It is meant to be overridden. And then there is uh, something that goes beyond configuration, like taxonomy terms uh, and uh, other stuff uh, that we still want to, to distribute uh, in our product. And again, you can do it in uh, the installation profile. I've uh, already seen this, uh, so basically these two slides explain what you have seen before of an uh, installation profile using for carrying uh, some configuration. Uh, we, we, we do it this way because uh, it's a uh, configuration that uh, applies uh, in, in a different way than, uh, than the configuration we store in features. An interesting thing is that a feature can have its own make file too. In, uh, in the set of files defining the features, there can be a make file, and this make file can make the feature truly modular by specifying everything that is needed to build this feature. So all modules that are needed to build these features, libraries, uh, and uh, I can really package functionality here, n not only in terms of configuration, but also in terms of dependencies. And uh, these dependencies should be chosen in a way that uh, allows to export everything. Not all contrib modules are ready for this, even though it's uh, uh, getting better and better. And uh, you should prefer modules that can export their configuration in code. Otherwise, it is possible with uh, tricks or standard tools like StrongArm or uh, C tools to, to make a module configuration exportable. So you are not uh, completely limited. You can do something to, to export configuration. And uh, we've seen, uh, I think, all the process of uh, getting to, to build a distribution and how to package uh, everything uh, in a distribution from uh, make file to, to country modules uh, configuration and uh, possibly some initial content. Okay. <clears throat> so, so far exactly we saw how to package and uh, to be the distribution. Let's see how, um, how we are going to arrive to our first uh, 1.0 release. So how to develop actually and maintain the distribution. So the main uh, problem in that is uh, upgrading process. A distribution must be upgradable. It means that uh, if a user downloads the 1.0, then a new release is out there, like 1.1. Then from 1.0 to 1.1, there must be a clear up upgrade path. So of course, we cannot do it with migrating content, because this is wrong. It's Drupal, so it, has, uh, it exposes hooks to do that, which are the um, update hooks. and. Um, for example, you can upgrade your features. So since features are modules, then you can um, uh, use the hook, uh, update n, where n is the number of schema of the, of the feature. Uh, and you can place it in the, in the install uh, file of the, of the feature. This uh, is to manage the feature update process and also to share changes with your development team, as we will see uh, in a second. Same goes for the profiles. Profiles uh, drives, uh, uh, the installation profile drives the life of, of your distribution. So everything that is a, a structural update of the whole platform must go into the up, uh, hook update and of the uh, install file of the installation profile. This is exactly, again, to manage uh, distributions update process, as well as to enable new features, for example, you have added to your distributions, or to handle structural update or to share changes with your development team. So uh, now we go to the core of uh, um, the way we develop with features, which is also very, really bound to the way uh, distributions work, which is the code-driven development uh, workflow. 
Your mantra must be keep everything in code. So everything must be in code. You never have to assume the state of the, data, the database that belongs to other developers. Um, for example, let's see you have two developers working on, uh, on Drupalissimo distribution. So you have developer A and developer B. They are not necessarily on the same place, so they have really um, bad way to communicate because they can only communicate online, etc. So this brings them to uh, not be able to make any uh, assumption on the state of the database or of the platform itself. So they have really to work independently from each other. So the first, first thing, they both run the installation process. So they install the platform from scratch. So they start from the same state of the, of the distribution. Then the developer A enables the block features. He develops the block features and enables it, while the developer B does something else. So since profile, profiles behave like modules, it means that they, they can run update hooks. So uh, the developer A can actually share the change of uh, enabling the new feature uh, in the platform with the developer B, just writing an upgrade path using the hook update N. This means that the, the developer B will then download, okay, the developer A will commit the block feature, of course, and the upgrade path he just uh, work on, and then the developer B uh, will um, download the, the latest code base. He will run an update, a Drupal update, and then uh, the states of his uh, database will uh, uh, then now include also the block features that was enabled by, by developer A. This is a way to share changes without sharing actually the database. So the two database states, they can run in parallel. The, there is no content overlapping or problem of synchronization, etc. cetera. Deve deve developer A can have his own uh, content, test content. Developer B can have his own test content too. And then just share that meaningful content, writing up great paths for them. So for example, now um, the developer B uh, made a mistake, let's say, okay? He was uh, uh, working on an uh, editor um, role, and then now he wants to uh, uh, remove it. So uh, what he does, he removes the editor role in the upgrade path, sharing this change with, uh, with the developer A. This, why, this is why, it's because you can never assume the state of the other developer's database. So maybe the, the developer A downloaded the database dump where the editor role was there, or the editor role was put in place since the installation profile, as we see. So now we decided to not have an editor role anymore in our distribution, so that's the way how to share this change. So always work with the Drupal APIs, never um, rely on, on database dumps, of course. So now the developer B uh, commits this uh, removing editor uh, role uh, change. And then um, the developer B just continues to work. Uh, he wants to patch a module, for example, the admin modules because he found a bug. So he downloads a patch from the Drupal issue, he just goes, goes uh, ahead and patches the module. Then he continues to work. Then wants to add uh, an OpenID account for, uh, for the administrator to be able to log in with his OpenID. So the way to do it is, again, writing an upgrade path in order to share this change also with developer A. So he writes the upgrade path uh, 7003. And then uh, just uh, using the Drupal 7 APIs, in this case the APIs of OpenID uh, modules, then he enables the, the um, OpenID account for the user one, which is the admin user. Another thing, he just patched the module, he patched the admin module. This is a very important thing because uh, now uh, the code of uh, the admin module is not anymore in line with the main uh, uh, master branch of the Drupal development. So um, we must keep a track of, of this change, of this patching, in also in order for the other developers to know that that module was actually patched. So if they need to upgrade that module to a newer version, they need to mine that patch. So the rule that the both developer agreed on was to always check the uh, drush make uh, file when we want to upgrade modules, for example. Or simply, uh, they can check also the logs of their uh, SVN update or whatever version control system they use to see that uh, the file changed. So we need to record this uh, patch in our make file. This also um, has, uh, is twofold, so you can, it's useful to share this information with your development team, but it's also useful when uh, a third developer will join, then the make file will patch that module according to that patch. So the code base will be consistent with the code base of the other two developers. So now 
the developer B commits its, its changes. As you can see, the marker of this uh, upgrade is a bit different from the other one. Why? Because it's a bit more important upgrade. It's not a development upgrade, it's a structural upgrade. Something that must be um, part of the installation profile as well, something that you must ship with. For example, now when the developer C joins, then he gets uh, the, the, the admin module patched because it's in the make file and also gets the, all the modules and uh, upgrades parts that were, uh, uh, were, were made available. Of course, the uh, update N is not enough because uh, exactly when the developer C will install uh, is a copy of, this, of the distribution, all the upgrade uh, N hooks will not be run by Drupal because Drupal, at a fresh install moment, Drupal assumes that all the upgrade paths, all the upgrade, um, update N hooks uh, are old hooks, are not uh, something that must be applied. So you need to store the meaningful changes that you want to store in, um, in your distribution. You need to place them into the install uh, hook. And this is what we call the structural upgrade. So structural updates are the one who goes, who are, who are part then from, of the installation profile. So 0, 01, 0, 02 were just development updates. So between uh, developer A and developer B. While 0, 03 becomes a very important structural updates which goes into the installation uh, profile. Now the developer C, when the developer C will run uh, an installation from scratch, he will also get uh, the open ID associated with the admin account. So the state of developer C is exactly the same as the state of developer A and developer B to start from, uh, from scratch. So you can install the project and then start to, to develop. So you can really do a lot of stuff uh, with the upgrade pass, uh, upgrade process in uh, your distribution. For example, let's have a look to one of the most popular distribution out there, which is Open Atrium. What they actually did in the, in the upgrade pass they were, uh, for example, altering comments tables or really hardcore uh, uh, altering uh, to suit the needs of the distribution or even the node table, uh, adding a key, node type, for example, for uh, optimizing search and this, this kind of stuff. Or they have also uh, installed new features. So when they enabled the first time the Atrium groups or Atrium members features, they were, do they were sharing this change in this way. These are all not structural updates, while, for example, uh, the, the 6003, it, it's a structure update, something that must be replicated also at the installation process because you want always the system table to be, to be updated or uh, in this way. So now we also prepared actually um, a quick reference uh, sheet that you can uh, be download, downloaded by, from our blog or also can be handed out. We have 15 here, so the first who comes after the presentation we get a free copy of it. You have like um, the most, uh, like it's a quick reference for the most useful uh, Drush commands that you may run when you work in a code driven development uh, workflow. Or also naming convention tips, uh, how you would work with extending and overriding your, uh, your features, etc. And also how to work with controller features and other tips that we find useful during our uh, uh, workflow and we want to share with all of you. If you, don't, if you are not able to get one uh, uh, here, you can always download it from our blog. You can go to visit our blog to nuvele.org slash blog or you can check also our trainings uh, in uh, nuvele.org slash trainings. We have a training about open atrium customization and the code and development workflow. So thank you very much. If you want to take the survey, just go to visit this link and then, uh, yeah. Thank you guys. So if you have any questions, have a microphone here but so if you wish to come down or, or speak up we can okay so the question is if uh, I can put own code own custom code uh, in, in the module file of a feature Right? If I do that, what happens? Ah, okay. If it is our practice to do it or not? Yes. yes. Yeah, we always do. I mean, we consider features as modules, so we really develop a feature, not in the sense of only storing the configuration, but also developing new functionality inside the features. So, yeah, that's uh, that sounds good. Vado io, magari, in giro.
Okay, so uh, briefly the question is, uh, using uh, code-driven development is, uh, is harder. It needs that you look at the Drupal API, you study functions, and uh, it is slower, uh, and at least it is a steeper learning curve. And uh, the, the question is if that is uh, effective or not. Uh, I'd say yes. In, in the long term, uh, it is going to be absolutely effective. And uh, it may happen that uh, in some installed projects, uh, you, you employ a mix of code-driven development and uh, an existing uh, database to, to make uh, things uh, quicker. I mean, uh, w when you have a stable structure and you export it into code, the, the fundamental function, you can carry a, a development database uh, with you as long as it is uh, controlled uh, and we do it uh, in a few projects. Uh, so I mean, uh, in the end, uh, this is a solution that is quite effective uh, and, uh, and fast. OK, so thank you. It's, uh, for the other questions, uh, you can ask us uh, privately because uh, it's lunch time now. And uh, just come here. And come here for the code-driven cheat sheet, too.